Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are back for another conversation, another episode, and a brand new guest. I'm here. Well, I'm, I'm here. I wish we were in person, Lysandra, but I'm joined by Lysandra remotely from Lysandra Photography. Thank you so much for making time for the Boca Podcast today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And we managed to work through some technical issues there at the beginning. So <laughs> thanks for your patience yes. with that as well. <laughs> Uh, this is this is going to be 300 episode, I think 329 or 330 that I've recorded. And nice. occasionally we, we run into some glitches, but we've we've managed to make it work regardless. So uh, awesome. here we are and, and we're going to be getting into a pretty deep topic today. And, and more specifically, well, first of all, we're going to touch on boudoir photography, but more specifically what it means to find sexual healing or even potentially bring sexual healing to clients through boudoir photography. So it's a pretty deep topic, maybe yeah. not necessarily the episode to listen to with um, the, the very little ones around. I'll just go ahead <laughs> and add that caveat here at the beginning. But yeah. um, I really appreciate you making time to and, and being willing to, Lysandra, get into a pretty heavy topic. So we'll get to that here in just a little bit. But we normally start the episode with a, a question and a conversation about brand position. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've talked about this so many times, but there are so many photographers out there. Boudoir photography, actually, that particular market has exploded over the last couple of years, two or three years at least. And oh, yeah. so we have to figure out how to stand out from the other photographers. If, if a potential client comes to our site, we have to be able to effectively communicate what makes us different from the other photographers, boudoir, wedding, portrait or otherwise, very, very quickly. And so I'm curious, yeah. how would you communicate your brand position to a potential client? What sets you apart? So our focus here at the studio is really dedicated to empowering women to really own their sexuality and embrace the vulnerability and all of the difficult parts in life and really step into their power and live their life intentionally and true to themselves. Okay, so you touched on a lot of points right there, but it, like if if I if I was doing consulting work for you and I said, hey, you know what? The first thing I'd love to see on your website is it's actually one of the lines that that I heard you say there is helping women embrace their sexuality, and this is something that that uh, it, it seems as though based on our our conversations and what I've seen on your site, what your your mission ultimately is would really beautifully sum up what you're doing, and and very succinctly communicate what makes your brand different because the topic and as we're going to dive into this more later but the topic of sexuality in many cases can be quite taboo people tend to avoid it and yes. the, if you were to put that out there right away they would th that potential client it, it either may push them away because they're too shy or too apprehensive they don't want to go there or it may immediately draw somebody in and say you know what i can go there with lisandra i can i can open up i can let my guard down and this could be a really incredible experience. I, I love the, um, I love that idea. So I'm just throwing that out there for you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but but um, this idea of sexual healing through photography is really a different angle. Um, I think that most photographers, are at least, willing to very, very clearly communicate, and it might be something interesting to kind of explore. You're a boudoir photographer in what market currently? So I'm located in Hampton Roads, Virginia. So there's seven cities in Hampton Roads. My studio is in downtown Norfolk, okay. which is mostly known for the naval base. Yeah. It's the largest naval base in the world. Um, so we do have a pretty interesting market here. Yeah, it, I, I can imagine. Um, it, does it tend to be dominated mostly by portrait photographers, wedding photographers, or boudoir photographers? Are there that many there? We actually have a, t oh, I mean, we pretty much have all of the photographers. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I know everyone says their market's saturated. I really think that like everywhere you go, it's going to be, there's photographers everywhere. Um, here, we definitely have a solid group of boudoir photographers and especially in like Norfolk area. 
we have, I, I honestly, we have a really great market here as mm. far as um, diversity of talent. There are a lot of photographers that specialize in different things. Weddings are definitely a, a lot of people come here for, for weddings, um, destination. This is sort of considered a touristy area too which still blows my mind. Well, so you have a mix of potential clients then, I guess, between the tourists and then there's probably a lot of uh, military personnel that are coming through, staying maybe for a short period of time. So there's an opportunity for new clients in the market on a pretty regular basis as well, right? Yeah, it's a pretty, we have 1.7 million people in Hampton Roads, I believe. Wow. Um, so yeah, we have a lot, of, there are a lot of people here. So there are a lot of people, there are a lot of photographers that can serve them. And um, I do have a lot of clients that come from out of town, either from Richmond or D.C. We've had a lot of people come from out of state this year, which has been really fun and just really awesome for me. So, yeah, we do get a pretty good variety. Well, and, and to my earlier point, that is you know more reason than ever to figure out how. And for our listeners um, who are continually hearing me talk about brand position, whether it's a local market or it's you know a national market that you're trying to stand out in, there are a lot of photographers. It, our, mm -hmm. our market overall is quite saturated with photographers. It's so important to, to figure out a way to stand out uh, amidst the oh, masses. Yeah. And um, so that's, of course, why we continue to talk about the significance of brand position. But from your experience as a photographer, Lysandra, are, are you, first of all, how many years have you been in business? So February marks 10 years in business. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that's really, <laughs> Thank you. really cool. Um, what would you say is one of the most important lessons that you've learned so far? Or put another way, if you had 15 seconds to share with a fellow photographer a, a piece of advice, what would that thing be? I think I, I could go on and on, but really the biggest thing is figuring out who you are and what kind of business you want to have, you, you want to run and being intentional about that. You don't have to buy the latest gear. You don't have to sign up for all of the things that guarantee you'll make money this way. It's It's really being authentic to yourself and making sure that your messaging is on point and being able to serve your clients and give really truly that's your clients are all that really matter. Now you talk about authenticity and knowing yourself. This is a, this is a topic that has become really, really popular in American culture in the last, I don't know, I'd say in the last five or six years in particular, maybe mm -hmm. even less, but it's, it's easy for those words, those phrases to become kind of cliche and just to be thrown out there and, and not quite know what they mean. Because in, I think in some cases it can be quite subjective or they can be quite subjective in meaning. What, what does that mean to you to know who you are? And, and did you have a personal experience in figuring that out? Definitely. Um, I've, so for me, knowing who you are is just really owning your own shit. Um, I've always sort of been the weirdo growing up. I was definitely the black sheep. I was like the token goth girl in high school. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed on your website, you talked about loving heavy metal music, right? Yes. I, yes. And that's something that's really like I, within the photography community, of course you, you, there's like the certain look and there's certain style and everything. And that's never been something that has been me, not just in photography, but anything I've always sort of been the the odd one and really embracing that and knowing that I don't have to, I, I have no desire to fit in with everyone else. I'm not for everybody else. And that is entirely okay with me because I'm pretty happy with who I am as a person. So for me, really like owning your own shit is just understanding that you're not, you're not the person for everyone. And that's totally fine because that's, you're not meant to be. Hmm. Um, so when it comes to business, um, I'm not for everybody and that's okay with me. Yeah. I mean, you, literally on, on your about page, it says, fuck what they think. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah. What, where do you think that that comes from and how much of that do you think is a statement that has been real free for a long time? Um, I, sometimes I see people say something like that and, and you can kind of tell that it's, not just, they're not necessarily a hundred percent feeling that way. It's almost like an exercise in progress. Uh, yeah. uh, it, what do you feel like that is for you? Where does that, that thought process come from? So I actually had this like metal bracelet that said, fuck what they think for, I got it right after my separation and I lost it this past summer when we were tubing on the lake. But for me, it was something that I wore around my wrist every day because it was a constant reminder, especially going through periods where I didn't necessarily feel that way. I didn't feel as strong or as confident in who I was. So it started, I've always sort of been 
like if you talk to my parents, I've always been the the rebellious one, <laughs> the um, the one that's very much outspoken. And over time, I was sort of forced to quiet that voice. Hmm. And I think that happens so often with women. Sure. Um, our voices get silenced or we don't feel like we can speak up and really be be ourselves and be comfortable with that and know that it's okay. So for me, it was really at the end of the day, dealing with family, dealing with friends, you name it. So many personal relationships in my life have gone through these various transitions and it's so easy to want to change yourself and adapt to be who other people want you to be, but you can't live that way. So for me, it was really just quieting the noise, fuck what they think. I'm going to do what I feel is best for me and be 100% in it. That's great. That's great. It can be exhausting to try to keep up with what other people want for you, or at least yes. what, what we project uh, that other people want for us, uh, rather than exactly um, certainly making sure that we're in a healthy place, but but ultimately just being ourselves. And and so this is this is a good reminder and certainly good encouragement for all of us. I appreciate you sharing that. Tell me a little bit about time because uh, I know that you have some pretty special people in your life. You're running a business on top of that. How do you? manage to, uh, I'll throw the word out there, balance very gingerly, because I know that balance is subjective, but how do you balance running a business and then also making time for yourself and for the important people in your life altogether? Um, I've always said like balance is just not something that's going to happen with me. <laughs> um, I told my fiance, I could be a great parent, a great business owner, a great fiance. It's going to be two out of three. It's not going to be everything at once. Um, and for me, it was releasing my own expectations on myself because I am a perfectionist and realizing I can't do it all. So knowing that there are times where I can focus head in to um, a few projects or things that are really important to me at that time and know that I can still sort of skate by with other, other things. Um, our schedule, we do have a pretty tight schedule. The kids have a lot of after school programs. And so typically from seven to about 7 p 7 a.m to 7 p.m we're going and then we sit down for dinner for me it, i've had to be very intentional with my time and making sure i'm scheduling myself appropriately every day i make sure i get my ass into the gym um it's something that's important for me for my physical and mental health yeah and so um it's really prioritizing the things that need to be a priority i cannot let myself fall by the wayside and having to really prioritize and protect my time. So with that, like managing my expectations of myself, managing other people's expectations on me, and then also putting some seriously firm boundaries when it comes to my business so that it's not overstepping into family time or time with my fiance. And, and you shared a variety of practical ideas there that our listeners can kind of grab a hold of. Even if they apply one of them, they could, they could begin to see a little bit of improvement in the way that they're managing their time. But I want to just kind of harp a little bit on the topic of starting the day in the gym. Um, I, I know that some would argue, well, and I'm not a quote morning person, um, or I prefer to work out later in the day, but there's something about, and, and I've realized this in the last few months in particular, as I've made a concerted effort to be more consistent in the gym. And we're not talking about two, three hours a day or, you know, going 20 times a week or anything in, insane or, or extreme, just mm -hmm. showing up for, it could be 20 minute workout and done. It could be, you know, I think I average right now about an hour. And there is something about showing up consistently there in the gym and getting your heart rate up and getting the blood flowing and sweating, doing some, some cardio or some variation on cardio, uh, lifting some weight. There is something about this physiologically, mentally, emotionally, and especially if we do it consistently, that can make a drastic difference in kind of giving us a, a nice head start to the day. Um, and, and it certainly gets us off our butt too, because, you know, the reality is we, we sit a lot of, as business owners. So movement's really important. The other thing too, I noticed is I, I sugar is a weakness of mine. And <laughs> I, and, and it used to be that I would tend to go to sugar, candy, chewy fruit, candy, chocolate, or otherwise, um, if I was stressed out and I've noticed as of late that my tendency, if I'm stressed out is more of uh, how can I get to the gym and release that yeah. stress at the gym. And I think that also comes from consistency 
in that place. So um, I'd love for you to comment on this. I just want to throw that out there because I've personally experienced the significance of this and um, it's easy to, you know, occasionally go to the gym or say we're going to do it at, at the New Year's and go for a couple of months and then fall off. But the consistency seems to make a big difference. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not a morning person either. I do wake. I my my own personal schedule has always been from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. is when I'm most productive. OK, but that doesn't necessarily work when you have three kids. So, <laughs> so typically our schedule is at 7 a.m. I wake the boys up. Um, my stepdaughter is up pretty early. She takes care of herself get them ready for school. Once they get home, I make sure that I'm always home from work or anything by 3 p.m. so that when they get off the bus, I'm there. Um, and then afterwards, we either take them to soccer practice or acting lessons or whatever. Um, and we make sure we go to the gym. So I'm usually, my my own personal schedule used to be from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. is when I would go in. But I met my fiance and our life's just Blending a family meant I had to adjust some things. Yeah. So now we typically go like when the kids are in practice and, and so, yeah, it's a, it's, I definitely would not be able to get it all done if I did not have that firm schedule in place. And it really does. It, it has to be made a priority. It's true. Yeah. It has to be made a priority, kind of an absolute almost like, you know, like you eat, like you sleep, you also work out and it it becomes a thing of consistency. And, and I love that you had, you had to figure out, I mean, I I mentioned working out in the morning. It actually works for me. I'm, I'm a single dad and and I get up um, with my kids in the morning. It's six 15 is my alarm is set and I get up, they're getting ready for school. I'll make my daughter Mm -hmm. lunch and then they're off, but they see their dad is also getting up because reality is my son drives now. I could just sleep in. He could take my, my daughter to, to to school and you know, we'd be set, but I also kind of want to set that example for them. So they see me getting up with them, jumping into the day. They know that I'm going to go to the gym, uh, at least in most cases. And and then I start the day off that way. But I love, you talk about blended family. My girlfriend, Jill, and I have been in a relationship for some time, and we don't currently live together, but we might as well in some ways, just mm-hmm. because we're constantly together. She has two kids, I have two kids. And so working out yeah. the, the daily schedule can be incredibly, <laughs> um, shall we say, well, just to put it simply, it can be stressful. And yeah. so you do have to be very intentional, as you said, and and then commit to certain things in order to make them happen. And I think that's really great. You mentioned working out in the afternoon. Uh, my daughter and I have begun, I, I've added an additional time in the gym. Right now we're, we're shooting for like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where I'll go to the gym again and I'll take my daughter with me. And uh, that's, that's been awesome. kind of a cool experience as well. But I just wanted to, to touch on that because I think it's really important. You know, it's, it's, again, it's kind of a cliche thing in our culture to talk about the importance of exercise. And yet I think a lot of us don't do it consistently and we make excuses for it. But I love that you prioritize that. I think it's a great example for all of us when it comes to managing time. Talk to me about an impactful business or self-help book uh, that has made a big difference in your life. I love everything that Tim Ferriss does. I'm obsessed with him. Are you really? Um, That's cool. Yeah. Ugh, yes, I love him. Um, I love his podcast. I, I really love his interviewing style. I also really love just that he does combine a lot of everything that makes us human. We all have similar struggles in life. It's part of the human experience. And I love that he really personalizes his guests and yeah. um, people who are in finance. Like I, I learn crazy things from like a venture capitalist that I ne- like I never would have thought to, to think about or listen to. But he breaks it down in a way that it's so easily relatable, very easy to listen to, very conversational. So I'll typically like if I'm in the gym, I'll listen to his podcast or we do a lot of driving, a lot of driving. So that, that's usually fun. Yeah, do your kids, um, do they get into listening to that podcast with you sometimes? Yeah, I sort of force them. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, a lot of the things that I'm very intentional about, like what I expose the kids to, Yeah. just because like I want them to have solid examples of like, these are things you do to improve yourself. I want to set that example hmm. for them. And for me, my business is extremely important to me. And my stepdaughter is sort of following in my footsteps, which makes me so happy. Oh, cool. Uh, she wants to start her own business. She wants to go to school for psychology. For me, it's been like, well, here are the things I've done in my life and that have helped me that can grow me. And hopefully I know they're, while they may not enjoy listening to it, I know that they're hearing it and they're, they're getting advice and, perspectives that they probably wouldn't be exposed to hundred percent otherwise. Yep. No, absolutely true. It it, it is kind of funny. Actually, I I used to play, there was a, 
a podcast um, that still exists by a guy named Ben Greenfield, who's a, a physical or a personal trainer, a triathlete, um, et cetera. I mean, just kind of the epitome of, of um, a physical specimen, not, not just through his exercise, but what he does for kind of organic approach to managing health, uh, just mm-hmm. a wealth of information. And this is something that I would play consistently uh, around the kids. So they were exposed to that. Uh, we've another thing that's been kind of fun more along the lines of entrepreneurship was we watched shark tank quite a bit together. Yes, and, I love shark tank. Well, and it was, it was a good exercise, uh, certainly for me, uh, just to kind of think through the process of, you know, a, a brand position and what it means to, to mm-hmm. pitch a brand to, uh, investors and to consider the, the multiple facets that, that somebody who are people who are experienced in business, uh, in entrepreneurship, what they're considering, the important ideas that they're considering around a business. But it was also quite interesting to watch even my daughter, who at the time was quite young, understand the principles and the concepts uh, yeah. to, to a level that was, it, it was fun because I could have a conversation with them about this thing that I, that I so love as well, but they were also learning mm-hmm. in the process. I think, I think it's a great idea not to minimize the intelligence of our, of our children, certainly to be intentional. I love that you're doing that, but, but expose them to ideas that ultimately over the long run can make a big difference in their life. And you, oh, yeah. and you talk about Tim Ferriss. I, I've um, I've been a follower of of sorts of, of Tim Ferriss actually for quite some time. Um, the the ideas around photographers edit my editing company and creating a business that was scalable and that didn't need me to be involved twenty four seven. Um, those mm-hmm. principles very much uh, tie into what Tim talks about in his book, The Four Hour Work Week. The Four Hour Work Week, yeah. And then, of course, he also wrote The Four Hour Body, which is quite fascinating for kind of a, a simplistic approach to managing health. Uh, he did The Four Hour Chef and uh, has done at least one or two other books since. But I, I did yeah. take some cues from his podcast as well when when uh, learning <laughs> how to be a podcaster. So that's cool. We'll link to some of his stuff in the show notes for those of you who are curious as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, if you go to bookapodcast.com, for those of you listening in, we post the show notes there. That's resources. We'll be linking to those talking points from the conversations. Make sure you take advantage of those. But let's let's talk about photography briefly here for a second. What is the most unusual item in your camera bag that enables you to be a better photographer? This doesn't have to be a camera or lens or flash. Uh, is there anything that comes to mind? So I don't actually, like I have my camera bag, but I don't typically use it because I leave, I, I now carry my camera with me. I used to leave it at the studio, but I got a new camera last November. And so I now make sure I'm carrying it with me every day. But um, I keep a yoga mat and yoga blocks in the studio because, really? yeah, and for me, it's not just, I mean, boudoir is pretty, it's a workout for sure. Yeah. For me, I had, I do struggle with chronic pain and a lot of like physical health issues. And so making sure I'm mobile and keeping my mobility top notch is it helps me massively. Um, I have to stretch every day so that my body doesn't freak out on me. And so when I get to the studio, I'll typically spend 15 minutes doing that, just getting my body ready. And then when I start with my clients, I have them stretch out as well. Really? Okay. So are you taking them through yoga poses or what are you doing? I am. Yeah. And things that I've learned from like, I was in physical therapy recently, things that I find would be helpful for them. I'll go through like a stretch routine. Huh. That's really, that's really cool. I've never heard of that being done before, but what a great idea. And, and especially in, I guess in boudoir photography, I'm sure not, not all poses require a whole lot of stretching or mobility, but in some cases maybe, and, and that probably is helpful as well. It's definitely, I find that a lot of the poses, while they're not necessarily difficult, they are putting a strain on your body and that you're holding positions. I try and shoot quickly so that my clients are having to hold them for too long. But while they look natural, the poses are anything but, and you're not typically arching your back all the time, for example. Sure, sure. So things like that, I get foot cramps like crazy while I'm shooting. And so I've had to adjust how I shoot personally. Another thing I guess that I really love that I have to use are my Doc Martin boots. I used to shoot barefoot. Now I cannot. So I wear my shoes while I shoot and I find that they help a lot. And that's wild. That See, I would automatically assume just from my experience with barefoot walking, running, um, that going the other way around would actually make a difference. But you had to actually go yeah. two shoes. I have plantar fasciitis and heel spurs in both feet. Okay. So, <laughs> so I definitely... I had to put shoes. I have to wear shoes. So even when I'm in the house now, I have to wear them and I, I hate it uh, because I like being barefoot. Like 
I try and get away with it. If I'm out outdoors, if we're like camping or something, I'll, I'll walk around barefoot, <laughs> even though I probably shouldn't. But yeah, for me, it's definitely, I have to wear my boots. Is there a particular yoga mat that you recommend or just kind of any yoga mat that you can get a hold of? I think, I, I don't think you have to go crazy with it. I think you can get a basic <laughs> yoga mat. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, I, well, that's a really fascinating concept, stretching before the session. That's a really interesting idea. And I appreciate you sharing that. It's definitely a standout. I've, I've yet to hear any photographer talk about that idea. But speaking of, you've got kind of an unusual backstory. I'd love for you to share just briefly, if you if you will, the story leading up to, I guess, this business that you now run, this boudoir photography studio. What did you originally go to school to study? I went to school to study to be a sex therapist. And that was the initial game plan. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and you'd mentioned this to me um, in our conversation leading up to today's interview. And it caught my attention for multiple reasons. One, I'm quite fascinated by relationship psychology myself. It may actually be Mm -hmm. a field that I still pursue one of these days. Um, But you also mentioned that you come from a conservative background. And so there was this aura is probably a nice way to say it around the topic of sex coming from a conservative background that wasn't great. And and I can s- certainly share in that idea. Can you, can you expound on that a little bit? I think for the most part, a lot of people grew up not discussing sex with their families. And for me, especially my mom is very Catholic. Sex wasn't ever something we discussed. Yeah. So when I was a freshman in high school, I told her, I want to be a sex therapist. She was like, (laughs) are you kidding me? What, what are you talking about? That's crazy. And I think she felt that I would sort of give up on that goal, but it, it, I didn't. So I went to school for psychology. I went to school in Hawaii, which was amazing. And while I was living there, I just picked up a camera because I wanted to take good pictures. And then I started the business because I wanted to afford new lenses. (laughs) So that's, that's where it happened. I was 19. And I didn't really have any idea of what I was what I was doing, really. But it was something I felt very strong, like I I grew to love photography. But with sex therapy, it's something that's been constantly on my mind. So I'm actually in the process of applying for grad school right now. That's really cool. Okay, so did you end up finishing your bachelor's there then? Yeah, I finished my bachelor's. I graduated um, with my bachelor's super early. But I'm very thankful for that. Well, yeah, for sure. And so your bachelor's is in what degree? In psychology. In psychology. And then you're going to go back and mm-hmm. get your master's. That's really cool. And I honestly, I'm yeah. envious. So I, when I went to school, I never did finish my bachelor's. I was at the small little school that, that, that has closed, first of all, but frankly, oh, no. um, didn't, didn't have any real significance in the educational world. And so um, I'm going to have to kind of hit the reset button if and or when I go back to school to, to study psychology, which I guess is fine. Um, but yeah. I, I just, I, I like, I, first of all, I'm, again, I'm just fa- fascinated by psychology, relationship psychology, but particularly when it comes to sex. I mean, certainly this is not a, a psychology podcast and I'm not a psychologist, but what I will say here is it's kind of interesting, you know, there's, there's kind of two sides to this conversation around sex and, and the seeming, seemingly taboo nature of it at times. I think part of what makes sex exciting at times is that taboo nature, but mm-hmm. then the irony is, and, and the flip side of that conversation is that it also can be quite damaging to one's psyche in relation to the topic. Our perspectives can be quite distorted. And so I, I w- I'd love for you to speak to now, I mean, we're fast forwarding a number of years, but you you started a photography business during that time. It took off. So you you went with it. You set that effort to get your master's aside for a bit. It's enabled you though to create some awareness and healing around this topic of sexuality. And and I'd love for you to expound on what that has actually looked like specifically. So um, personally, I guess my experiences with sex and sexuality are like, like we discussed before, there's been, there's always been a lot of shame and stigma surrounded, surrounding it. And so to do boudoir, which is so tied to sexuality, I feel like there's a lot of times, a lot of people like to distance themselves from it and Mm. say, this is, it's not, of course, we know photography is very different from porn, but to sort of, at least when I started shooting boudoir, the idea of sexualizing the images, I guess, was not something you discussed. And with posing, it was very pretty and very flattering and all of that, but it didn't really dive deep into the core of what we're doing this for. It's to excite our ourselves, our partners, you name it. So for me, it was really 
looking at why do I shoot this? Why am I drawn to it? What do I feel our clients are getting from it? Um, and over the years, I realized there's so many people that come in. We have we have the Me Too movement right now. And that's been eye opening for me in many ways. With boudoir photography, personally, it was it was my own way of working through my own sexual traumas or history and everything yeah. too. So yeah. there's a lot there. And I find that a lot of times, so many women, it's, I feel like you'd be hard pressed to find a woman who hasn't been sexually assaulted or molested or abused in some way or taken advantage of. And because of that, we, we carry so much baggage with us. We carry so many traumas that we're not working through or we haven't been able to express or talk about. I personally was sexually abused as a child and I never talked to my family about it. Mm. It wasn't until right before I moved out of the house that it was ever even brought up. Wow. But even then it wasn't something I wasn't heard. I wasn't believed. I was questioned. And here I am, I'm 16, 17. Wow. And my, my family didn't even really acknowledge or And it's not, I don't think it was an intentional decision to not acknowledge it, but it was because they weren't ready to discuss it and go into it and talk about it that I felt it just, it it just made the situation worse. So in the studio, I feel giving people a place to talk about it, being able to give people a place to express it, Mm. to fully dive into it has been so healing and therapeutic, not just for my clients, but for myself as well. Yeah. And while it does suck to know it has happened to so many people, there is a comfort in knowing women are able to go through these huge life changing shifts. And we bear so much shit that we're, we're forced to like hold these burdens and we still truck on. And so boudoir has been extremely, um, it's just been such an extremely powerful and personal thing for me because I see so much of my own personal life experiences in my clients and I'm able to sort of connect with them on that. Wow, that's it's really incredible though. I I love the and this sounds almost trite um, because we use this word a lot in the podcast, but I love the the proactive mentality and approach that you have to dealing with your past. And um, I'm sure that there have been certain ways individually that you've had to go back and address your past and work through things. But the fact oh, yeah. that, that <laughs> but the fact that you're ultimately finding healing through helping other people work through their past uh, or potentially even their present and Mm -hmm. express themselves in this way through this boudoir photography, that's proactive. You know, it's easy to, whatever the thing is, whether it's sexual trauma uh, or otherwise, to sit and hold on to that pain um, Mm -hmm. and and understandably so in, in many cases, to sit and hold on to that pain and not actually move beyond it. And, um, and yes. the fact that you are doing just that in a very proactive, constructive, and even helpful way, certainly to your clients and, and ultimately to you, I, I think that's just a, a beautiful way to approach your life. And I love that you found that outlet through photography as well. But I'd love for you to, to make this even more uh, specific or, or help our listeners understand more specifically what it is that you're doing through these sessions that enables that kind of healing um, through the boudoir photography, you mentioned that there are a few specific ways that you do this. Can you share those with us? So I think one of the biggest things I've noticed is that my clients look to me and they look to me for direction, of course, within the studio when posing all of that, Yeah. but not, it goes beyond that. I think it, they also look to me for direction as far as how to handle different difficult situations, mm. being able to be open and expressive for me. Like I said earlier, like owning your own shit is really a big part of being authentic to yourself. And in my business, being able to talk about things like this openly, being able to own my own shit and know that I can work through these things and be open about it and showing our clients that you can talk about this. It's something that you can talk about. You can, you can work through. So when we're at the studio, we do spend time in hair and makeup and we do talk about a huge variety of things. It's not always heavy. There's definitely a lot of levity in there. We joke, we have fun. But we do get down to it when we do start shooting. I do talk to our clients about anything that might be potentially triggering to them, anything that they're concerned about expressing, what they want to express. And I always ask our clients, when you look at your images, how do you want to feel? We also have our, our Facebook group and our community that we have is 
insane. It's amazing. I fucking love those women. And I know that that community has helped so many people grow just from hearing other people's stories, people being open about things, myself being open uh, by creating a community where people feel that they can come and talk openly and work through these things. I think that's been huge. We also do monthly get togethers and monthly talks. It's called let's talk about sex. And every month we have a different topic. And so our clients will come in past clients, current clients, potential clients, you name it. I it's open to everybody. And one of the biggest things it's the whole reason why I started it is because I wanted to start these discussions around sexuality and break down the stigma and the shame that oftentimes associated with it. Wow. Okay. So you said this is with clients or non-clients and you've created, this as a get together that you have at your studio every month. Yes. So we actually just had our last one on Sunday. It was a brunch and um, our focus for that one was intimacy. So relationship intimacy, not only that, like the, I think when it comes to intimacy, it's how well you know yourself and how you're able to better express yourself and better able to communicate with your partner. So uh, we've had talks like kinks, non-monogamy, like you name it. <laughs> all, Role playing. Covering all gamuts. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And and every, the, every month we meet and we discuss something else because everything that we do in life is in some way going to impact our sexuality, whether it be struggling with a chronic pain disorder or struggling with disease, struggling with financial, like financial situations that come up, like everything that we go through in life is going to impact us in some way. And it definitely extends to your sex life. It definitely extends to your relationship. So um, I found that coming together really helps. And it also helps other women know that they're not alone. They are not the only ones that struggle with certain things. They're not weird for it. They're completely normal. So being able to provide that really safe and loving environment, I think has been huge. Yeah, you listed a number of things there, but that's how, I mean, you just summed it up beautifully too, that really what you're doing through all of these activities is you're creating a safe space for these women to be heard and mm-hmm. and ultimately to help them feel better about themselves too. And and again, I I, I have to give you major props for this because I, I love the proactive nature of, of what you are doing for yourself and for these women as well. I think it's a really beautiful thing. Can you just walk you. us through, and, and I w- want to continue to try to make this as practical as possible for our listeners. Can you walk us through what a session looks like and maybe even what leads up to a session? Because I'd love to give our listeners an idea of how you're creating this space very, very specifically, very tangibly. So from first contact there, I actually completely changed my process for handling initial inquiries. But typically, our process is to chat with them, discuss their needs, why they're having a session. In the beginning, it's really just making sure we have availability, making sure we're in the right price point. And from then, we'll go on and discuss the actual session itself. So I typically, I used to not do in-person consults. I'm going to do, I'm starting to do those now, either through in-person or through FaceTime on the phone, just so that I'm able to better connect with them and get a better idea of like why they're coming in for their session and making sure that it's going to be something that's very impactful for them in their lives. Um, Like I said, I'm not the photographer for everybody. I'm also at a very different price point. And so um, I want to make sure that they are getting their money's worth for sure. And then also that we're, we're serving the people that we really need to. Um, so when we get initial inquiries, we do a consult. When they come in for their session, we lay out their outfits. We take a look at everything. They talk to a hair makeup artist about what kind of styles they have in mind. And then the stylist will also recommend things based on their, their sort of color palette. And then from there, they sit in hair makeup, usually between an hour to an hour and a half. I don't have a time limit for my sessions because I don't feel like you can't rush intimacy. You can't rush things like this and a lot of vulnerability. If I yeah. want my clients to open up, I can't have a time limit on them yeah. and tell them like, Oh, I got another client for, for me. When I have a client in for this at the studio, my day is their day. Like I was going to ask time you, is so, their time. so you wouldn't schedule a second portrait session on a day. It's, it, it's one a day. So you can truly relax and fo- or I'd say relax, but you, you can truly focus on, on them and yeah. not be concerned about another session. Yeah. And I also like, I'm fucking exhausted afterwards. Like I, uh, after sessions, I, I couldn't, there are photographers that are able to shoot multiple sessions a day and major props to them. I cannot do that. Sure. I'm typically very drained mentally, emotionally, physically, you name it. 
So, um, so yeah, we, I only take on one session a day. Huh. That's fascinating. Okay. So, but what does that, that process look like? You talked about makeup. I'm on your site now and, and the information section that talks about professional hair and makeup, as you mentioned, but then access to the 150 plus item studio wardrobe. Yes. Um, and then the session, I know that you don't set a time limit on it, but what's the average session length in the end? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, our client, there are some clients that we have had in the studio until like eight o'clock at night, but, <laughs> wow. but and that's, it's rare occasions when we really get to chatting. I, one client in particular, we, I, she's like my best friend now. I call her my sister because we spent her whole day just hanging out. I was supposed to go to Richmond for a date night. And my fiance is like, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh, sorry about the studio. But typically I say, uh, three to four hours on average, if wow. we spend an hour and a half to in hair makeup, then typically I try and shoot pretty quickly. I, I try not to make anyone have to hold poses if they don't need to. Um, and I do, I've been doing this for almost 10 years. So I have a pretty solid process in place, but most of the time I could, I could, if I did not talk, I could shoot a session in 30 minutes, but because we do talk a lot, we do, um, before they start posing and everything, I go through my pose run through and my sort of shoot run through. And so after hair and makeup, we take a look at the studio closet. We get them in outfits if they already have theirs. Otherwise they can choose what we have and then I'll sit them down and I'll, I'll typically then ask like, why are you having a session? So for the most part, I find that our clients tell us two different things. When they come in for the session, our stylist usually asks, why are you doing it? And a lot of times they'll say, it's for a gift, it's for this, or it's for that. But when our stylists leave and they're just sitting down with me, hmm. I get a very different answer. Yeah. And when I'm shooting, I am the only one in the studio. So our stylists, when they're done hair and makeup, they head out. And I do that because I want my client to be, it's, it's hard enough getting naked for a stranger. It's even more difficult to get in, naked for a room full of strangers. Hmm. I definitely have our stylist leave. We sit down and we talk and that's usually where I hear a bit more of a um, expanded upon story of why they're coming in. Yeah. And that's where we'll sit down and we'll really touch on those, those hard points that they may not have expressed through email or through our phone call. A lot of times not everyone is ready to share their story and why they're willing, why they're having the experience until they're actually there. And that's when, the floodgates sort of open. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and from there, that's, that's when I'll take over. So I'll listen to them. Um, I sit with them and we talk about why they're having their session, what they'd like to gain from it, what they want to feel when they look at their images. And I give them my pose run through, like I explain how I will guide them throughout the process as far as posing goes, as far as myself coaching them, I'll give them breathing exercises. We'll move around. We'll stretch out. And then we'll get started shooting. And do you do you set the tone further with music? Do you do drinks? What what's your take on those things? Yeah, I do. Um, we do have music playing at the studio. So before they come in, I do send out a questionnaire, and it asks pretty basic questions as far as like what kind of products they'd like to create, what kind of things are you sort of self conscious about, what would you like to focus on. I'm I'm repeatedly asking them similar questions because I. I find that I get different answers every time. Not ne sorry, not necessarily different answers, but I get I get something and then they expand on it each time I ask. So I try and really over probably over communicate with my clients, but I find that it helps. Uh, the music definitely helps too because it would be really awkward to sit in a quiet ass studio and try and pose. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, you gotta kind of set the tone. Yeah. So I do, I do have music playing and I do rec I ask like, if you have any preferences, if not, I have my personal go-tos that I'll put on. Usually everyone's like top forties. I'm like, okay, I can do that. If someone allows me to put on music that I like, it's even better, but I know <laughs> not everyone listens to death metal. So. <laughs> and what are your, th what are your thoughts about alcohol? Because I've, I've heard both. I've heard, yeah, I have drinks there to help people relax. And I've also heard no, I don't do alcohol because I want them to be like truly present and, and go through this process very cognizant. What are your thoughts? So we don't, we don't provide alcohol for the studio because you would need a liquor license for that. Okay. I do tell them if you want to bring alcohol, you're welcome to, but we do have a two drink maximum because I don't want anyone getting wasted during their shoot. <laughs> right. Um, but I know a lot of people do need something to help loosen them up a little bit. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, as long as, as they're being responsible. And then I guess, lastly, I'm, I'm, when when you have that conversation, 
are you and helping them understand not only the process, but maybe help them get to know you a little bit more, help them feel a little bit more comfortable with you. How often do you end up going a little bit deeper and sharing some of your story so that they feel like they can relax, uh, like you empathize with them, understand their potential discomfort, some of the struggles that they have when it comes to kind of bearing their sexuality? What, what does that conversation look like? Uh, we talk about it with every session. Wow. Um, and a lot of times we do talk about it before their session. We talk about it in our client group. We talk about it at the get togethers. So it's definitely, like I said, I over communicate with my clients. And like I said before, I find that when I'm open and when I'm willing to share these things, then they are as well because they feel comfortable and they yep. know that they're not alone in it. Yep. So when they do, um, when we sit down in that, like after hair and makeup or even during hair and makeup, we do, we talk about some of the stuff during hair and makeup as well. Our stylists, I'm very particular about who we have come in and style the the girls that I have been working with for a few years. So I know that when they come in, they're going to be with people that are not going to judge them. They're going to people with people who support them, who are mm. very loving, who are very encouraging and also very fun. And prior to this, we do have discussions like in our, our client group is seriously amazing. Um, I couldn't rave enough about it. But I find that from that, a lot of people are able to get a feel for who I am, how I sort of operate, how my person, like my personality. And so they come in already feeling like they know me. Hmm. I've been like my, as far as branding goes and everything like that, I'm, I make sure it's very much who I am. It's very true to myself. So when they come in, they know what they see is what they get. They know how I'm going to talk to them. They know I'm going to dive deep. They know these things because it's, it's all right there in front of you. And not everyone like, like on my website, like fuck what they think. Not everyone is going to be down with that. And that's totally fine. Yeah. But you've probably done a pretty good job of filtering out the irrelevant clients. If they've taken any time to go through your website. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I can tell if they read stuff. <laughs> yeah. Are they, do they become part of the Facebook group before the session to give them kind of further context to what it is that you do? Yes. And I actually get a lot of clients from my Facebook group. Okay. So when we have people who inquire, I do link them to our Facebook group. I send all, um, after, so after they book, they do get a series of emails from me. One being a what to wear guide, one being a how to prep, one being a uh, posing, like little homework things that they're, I send to them. Not everyone does them, but I find that they're extremely helpful. And I'm always super thankful when I know someone's done their homework. But in that, I do include a link to our group. And I ask them, like, add some of your girlfriends, add, add anyone you feel would benefit from this. Wow. Well, you know, there's, there's something to be said for doing work through our business, through our brand that goes beyond us. If, if, it's, if at the end of the day, yeah. what we do kind of centers around us, our ego, um, it, it's, I think we miss out on multiple levels. Oh yeah. If we're putting our effort and energy into building something that is much bigger than us, that is about helping other people, um, mm -hmm. not just about putting money in our pocket, but, but bringing in this case, healing to others, um, and ultimately building community through that effort. I, I mean, again, props to you. And, and I love that, that you are making that effort to go beyond yourself. And I think that we should all take a cue from that. And, and for that thank reason, you. and, and many others, uh, I have to thank you again for making time for the podcast today. And we just share somehow, I don't think we've actually mentioned your website address or Instagram yet. Will you share both of those with our listeners? Yeah. It's so on Instagram, it's Lizandra photo, L E Z A N D R A photo. And my website, Lizandra And Perfect. Facebook, same thing, Lizandra photography. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll link to all of those in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But Lysandra, thank you again for hanging out with me today and sharing with our listeners. You're welcome. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com.